again, my name is Dave Letterer. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm a, I'm a pulmonologist uh, and I co-direct the ILD Center at Columbia University in New York. And my job is to try to distill everything you've just heard about um, in the past hour or so uh, and really drive it home in a very practical fashion. So that is, that is what, I, what I hope to do here. These are my um, consulting relationships. So um, I think a lot of us when we're learning this or when a patient's walking in the office, um, I think we get stunned by the acronyms. IPF, ILD, DTLD, AIP, COP. By the way, it took a long time to get these letters to line up in the suit. That was not easy. I need, my 15 year old did it for me. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and so uh, in the same vein, when we see this categorization that many of you may have seen before where we divide the ILDs into known cause, unknown cause, granulomatous, and others, the list that falls out below each of these becomes overwhelming. And so my job is to make you understand that this is a distraction. This is a distraction. And I'm going to point out two really important things right now and then one super important thing later. And there's really only one thing I want you to walk away with that I'll tell you at the end. So the two really important things right now are that when a patient shows up in my office with a fibrotic ILD, 75% of them have one of three diagnoses, which makes my life a lot easier. Instead of looking at 130 diseases, I'm usually trying to pin them down between one of three. And they are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a connective tissue disease related ILD, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So essentially the diseases you just heard about. And the other 25% have one of 100, 100 different things. Um, the second really important thing I want you to know uh, is about the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Uh, as you will hear about, these all originated at, as pathological, histopathological patterns, and then operationalized as actual diagnoses when we find those patterns in the absence of an identifiable cause. What that implies, and here's the important thing, is that for most of these, you cannot confirm that diagnosis without histology, which means that you don't need to be staring at a CAT scan and saying, oh, which one of these is it? That's not your job. That's not your job. So I'll just mention, of course, that IPF, you don't necessarily need a biopsy. We have criteria for a diagnosis of IPF. We've looked through all of those things you just heard about, couldn't find the cause, we see peripheral lower lobe, reticular pattern with honeycombing and or with some biopsy features of usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. Uh, and of course, I see a lot of unclassifiable ILD, which I think just means I'm not so, so good at this, but I end up with a lot of people in that category, either with or without a biopsy. But for pretty much all of these others, I would recommend not making a confident diagnosis without, a, without histology. I know that some people can do that. I, I'm not able to. So those are two really important things. 75% of three diagnoses. Don't bother trying to sort these things out in, in your mind. That's not your job. I'm going to show you what your job is. You're going to hear a whole talk on high-rise CT, but I love showing this slide. I can't not show the slide. This is the same patient, same scan, same slice, same window settings. But the one on the left is using a standard kernel reconstruction, and this is using a high kernel or high re frequency resolution algorithm. Uh, and to me, they give me different information. How many people feel that those two images give you different information about your patient? Yeah, yeah. So talk to your radiologist, make sure you're getting high res CTs, okay. So you do your history, you do your physical, you incorporate some of the serologies you may have talked about and you do a CAT scan and many times the answer is clear. Um, you know what you're gonna do, but sometimes it's not clear and you're left thinking about doing a biopsy. And I, I know I'm rushing through this because I want to get to a case that exemplifies all of these things. Um, and uh, we're going to hear a wonderful lecture on histology of, of interstitial lung diseases. And I am a proponent of getting tissue when I think it's going to influence my management, maybe not so much diagnosis, but my management of the patient. But I also try to avoid it. I do everything I can to avoid a biopsy. I go back to the history, the physical serologies. Did I, did I get a good CAT scan? Do I really need the histology? Maybe I do, often I do. 
but is it safe? They have too much honeycombing, bad pulmonary hypertension, high oxygen requirements, actively getting sick under my eyes, a low DLCO or low FBC, significant comorbidities or physical frailty, all would sway me away from a biopsy. I'd rather have the absence of information than put someone at risk for a complication. Doesn't mean I don't send people. I send a lot of people for biopsy. Okay. So having said that, I just wanted to get that stuff out there because it complements what you just heard. We're going to do one case and then we're done. And at the end of the case, you're going to know one thing. I hope you already know it, which would be great. Then I have a purpose to this. So this is a case, 58-year-old man comes to your office with six months of dry cough and you find out that he has never smoked. He did have an episode of community acquired pneumonia 10 years ago, not hospitalized. No history of asthma, no other chronic uh, lung diseases in the past, denies heartburn symptoms, gastric regurgitation, uh, postnasal drift symptoms, he's not on any ACE inhibitors, there's no hemoptysis, right? Kind of a, you've seen these patients all the time. Um, but then when you ask, it does turn out he's had breathlessness mowing the lawn this year, but not last year or the year before. So, you know, I actually had to stop mowing the lawn, take a break, catch my breath, and then continue. And that was totally different than the previous spring and any other spring before that where I felt fine. And I thought maybe, you know, I'm just getting older. No orthopnea, no uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, chest pain, ankle swelling, wheezing, I mentioned hemoptysis, no fever, chills, weight loss, travel, HIV or TB risk factors. So you're trying to pin this down, sort this out. Okay. You ran out the history. So this is a real case with a few things modified. He did have a history of claustrophobia. Um, hypertension is not related. Uh, hypertension, at least I think it's not related. Maybe he's, uh, maybe, no, I'm kidding. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, gout. Um, this is, uh, Murder's going to hate me for this history, but he's an, he was an accountant, never in the military. He only takes medication starting with the letter A. And his exam, no increased work of breathing, looks well. Uh, he's obese, 96% uh, breathing room air at rest at sea level where I work. Uh, no jugular venous distension, normal cardiac exam, and has bibasilar crackles, which are the predominant finding on exam. Uh, and everything else seemed to be pretty benign. So let me summarize that for you. 58-year-old man, never smoker, cough, some exertional dyspnea that's new, and bivasilar crackles. So now is the time where you guys have to talk to me, please, so it's not just me talking. So what's in the differential? And it's a long list, right? So yell a few things out. I'll start. I'll be. <laughs> All right, what are the other more obvious things? There's one kind of obvious thing, dyspnea crackles. IPF, I agree, but heart failure, right? Heart failure's got to be in that differential. Anyone want to add anything to that? Well, the cough could still be all the usual cough things like, you know, chronic rhinosinusitis and GERD, even though it doesn't have symptoms, right? Or even an asthma equivalent, maybe. It's not an ACE inhibitor. It wasn't a smoker. Anything else? Maybe an anginal equivalent, maybe. You're kind of pushing it. He shouldn't have crackles in the office if he has that. All right, you guys are really quiet. Okay. So these are just a few things I threw up there. Some of them definitely are not going to be the case, right, in this particular case. But just things you might put up there when someone has dyspnea or cough. These are some of the things you might think about. Do you guys think this is reasonable? Okay. And I guess one important point is please put that at the bottom of your list. And that's, that's if you can't find it if you're not thinking about it, right? Okay, so with this in mind, what would people do next? Chest x-ray, excellent, I totally agree. What else? PFTs, would, who would get spirometry? Raise, show your hand, show your hand. Spirometry. Okay, who would get lung volumes? Who would get diffusion capacity? Great, what else would you guys do or think about doing? Six-minute walk test, excellent. All right, how about it rhymes with Echocardiogram. <laughs> Echocardiogram, EKG, anything else? CBC, I like that. Good, I think that's excellent. You might do, you know, you might do a cardiac stress test if you're worried, but it, that seems less likely right now. All right, so chest x-ray here, chest x-ray. Um, normal or abnormal? That's what I always do, right, with, the, with trainees, normal or abnormal. Um, so clearly volume loss on the right, tracheal deviation to the right, the lung fields are not normal. Um, there are um, reticular uh, opacities here that maybe they're a little more predominant in the lower lung zone, hard to tell. 
Maybe they're a little bit peripheral, they are bilateral, but striking volume loss, I think the lateral um, shows you similar findings. Anything I'm missing there? Okay, excellent, thank you, Mary. Um, and you do the other things you talked about, you got an echocardiogram, guys, it was pristine, there's not even diastolic dysfunction on this, everyone's got diastolic dysfunction, no diastolic dysfunction, normal relaxation, valves are okay, and you get spirometry, and hey, FVC is 55%, FEV1 is 63%, the ratio is normal, and diffusing capacity is way low. So suggest restriction, I didn't get lung volumes on them initially, um, and, and pretty severe uh, gas, uh, impaired gas transfer at rest. Sound reasonable so far? Okay. So now let me update that summary, you know this, but now we know bilateral markings, normal echo, reduced FEC, no airflow obstruction, reduced DLCO. Maybe I can cross a few things off the list now. All right, what do you do next? HRCT, excellent. And would anyone do anything else instead of an HRCT first? Good. HRCT, excellent. Um, again, this is a high kernel reconstruction. Now, I like viewing these scans, setting the window at a center or sometimes called level of negative 700. Um, the default on many of the machines or the software I've seen is like, negative 500 or so, but I like this brighter, this looks brighter than what you're used to when you're looking at the skin. I, this is my own preference. I'll defer to our radiologist later to tell us what, what she likes. Um, but uh, I like this because I really think it enhances uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, so things look whiter and uh, so normal or abnormal? Abnormal. And we're really only going to focus on the lung fields here. Uh, and certainly there are some areas that look almost perfectly normal. That's probably normal. Maybe that's normal. But there's a lot of abnormality here, a lot of reticulation, You maybe even some around the airways here. And it has a, a peripheral flavor, but look at the actual pleural surface. It's not as severe here as it is here. So we sometimes call that subpleural sparing, and we see that kind of on both sides. So maybe this is involving the small airways a little bit more, bronchiolocentric, um, but definitely abnormal. I'm only showing you this, this one slice. And Here's the updated slide, so you know all this stuff, and now reticulation, subpleural sparing, and no honeycombing. All right, what's the next step? What's the next step? Biopsy? What? Not biopsy? What do, wait, I thought we'd do biopsy after CAT scan. What do we do? Oh, that's the thing to know. Before you biopsy, see, I, I'm leading you down this path to biopsy. Before you do that, this is what you need to know, is take a breath, bring them back in the office, and go through this, which I've ignored, intentionally ignored, and now drawing your attention to it, is to go back and do a history. This is so important. This is where you pick it up, right? Because you didn't know they had ILD until now. They had symptoms, something was going on, the x-ray is abnormal, but bring them back. Hey, have you ever had AFib and been on amiodarone? Have you had urinary tract infections and had to take nitrofurantoin? Have you had cancer that you didn't tell me about and had chemotherapy or radiation treatment? Um, do you have joint pain, sti stiffness or swelling, morning stiffness in the hands lasting more than an hour, dry eyes, dry mouth, ray nose, severe GERD symptoms with or without gastric regurgitation? Did I mention ray nose? Yeah. Um, skin thickening or tightening, sun, rash and sun exposed areas. How long have you lived in your home? Do you have forced air heating in your home? Is it humidified? Have you had a mold problem in your home? Have you had water leaking in your home or flooding in your home? And ask them that question twice. Because they first say no, and you say, are you sure you haven't had water in your home? And they say, well, we have had water in the basement a few times. So ask it. Um, do you have hot tubs, humidifiers? down bedding, feather pillows, birds. You have birds in your home that you take care of. Are there birds outside your home that you take care of? Do you have friends or neighbors who have birds? Did you used to have birds? Because you'll get different answers. Uh, and then do you have another home? And what about the home before the one you have now? So start going through all of these things. You heard the wonderful pneumoconiosis history. That's the next step. All right, so here's, boom, here's your data. You've done a really nice history and you've done that physical exam for telangic acasias and Gatron's papules and mechanics hands, and I'm gonna give you a bunch of different scenarios. I'm totally not timing myself, which is terrible. I'm failing at my job. 
So the only thing you found in your extensive review is they have a forced hot air heating system, which I see a lot in the Northeast. We have a lot of that. Um, so what, what would you do if that was the case? Would that, would that worry you? Because these things get contaminated with mold. So yeah, so that CAT scan's not perfectly typical for usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, nor is it really typical for chronic HP in my experience. Um, but I would worry in this person where I haven't figured it out that maybe that's the source of mold in their home. Uh, oh no, sorry, I went along the wrong row. It's water damage, flooding, and mold. Um, so th that person who literally has flooding and mold in their home that they know about, I'd be very worried about HP coming up and I'd try to reach that diagnosis. Okay, so that's, and then you could decide to biopsy them or not. We'll talk about what you do in a moment. Here's a different patient who has on history skin thickening or tightening that you then observe on their fingers, has Raynaud's phenomenon, some heartburn, and on serologies, ANA and SCL70. So that makes you lean towards autoimmune disease, probably systemic sclerosis in this case, so get rheumatology involved. Different case, gray nose, positive ANA, and a low titer of U1RNP, which my gosh, I see so many people with a low positive titer of U1RNP, I don't know what to do with that. Send them to the rheumatologist, see if they have an underlying autoimmune disease, and if they don't, then bring them back for discussion, figure out what they might have with or without a surgical lung biopsy. I'm sorry, I have a bias towards <laughs> surgical versus other biopsies, so I just mean biopsy. And an alternative case down here, you know what, oh doctor, I forgot to tell you, when I was 20, I had Hodgkin's and I had all this radiation treatment to my chest. Now that CAT scan looks nothing like what you'd see in radiation treatment to the chest, but in someone with ILD, that's a critical part of the history. Okay, so here's the patient in reality is I did everything. I did hi better history, I did some better physical exam, and I tried to look for a family history and all my serologies are negative. And this is the patient we see all the time in the office. So here's your updated summary. You know all of that stuff and everything else is unrevealing. So what do you do? Have you made a diagnosis other than ILD? No. Has ILD. We all agree. So what do you do? So we got one vote for multidisciplinary discussion. Anything else? Would people do surgical biopsies? or cryo or transbronchial, yeah, so tissue, tissue, I like tissue, tissue, and um, what about just trying some steroids? Do you want to try steroids? Oxygen testing, okay, yes, and I'm, you know, I'm, sorry, I'm just focused on diagnosis, you're absolutely right, for, no, 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 you're right, you're right, Kathy, for further evaluation and management, and I agree. For sure, and in fact, you'd probably want to do that before you biopsy them too, right? You'd want to evaluate them. So there is no right answer here, right? So you could take them to biopsy. I think you're justified in the setting of not knowing what they have. If you biopsy them and they have a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, yeah, that CAT scan is not typical, but you might reach a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then be able to offer them antifibrotic therapy, or it might identify chronic HP pattern, in which case, you might treat them very differently depending on the extent of inflammation that's visible on, on the uh, uh, histological pattern, uh, or maybe, maybe you didn't get the full history and then you go back and find out about the birds that's happened to me, unfortunately. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about cryobiopsy later. Multidisciplinary discussion, love it. Get people in a room or just as simple as getting the pathologist on the phone or getting the, the radiologist on the phone and talking about the case um, and trying to figure out what this might be. Um, I was just on the phone with a couple of, with a radiologist and a pathologist reviewing cases the other day who were not at my center. We were reviewing cases virtually, and it was amazing to me how our thinking converged. Started that different, but converged. It's really impressive. Um, trial of corticosteroids. I like. I hate steroids. Who hates steroids? We all hate them. I try to do everything I can to not start corticosteroids. Sick patient in front of you. They have to treat. You have to treat. Um, there are, of course, other immunosuppressants that you may hear about later. You'll hear about antifibrotics. And don't discount watchful waiting. I mean, I, I, I try to get to the diagnosis. I try to biopsy and figure it out early rather than waiting. I don't, why would I biopsy a sicker patient later rather than biopsy now and figure it out? But I, I don't want to tell you that's unreasonable. That's clinical judgment. So my last slide is this, which is what I was asked to talk about, and I'm barely going to talk about it. 
which is multidisciplinary discussion. I've already referred to it, um, often is a combination of clinicians from multiple specialties, radiologists uh, and pathologists, hopefully in the same room, but as I said, even on the phone, you can, you can make progress there. Uh, there's data that getting people to discuss these cases uh, leads to greater agreement in diagnosis. I don't know if agreement is tantamount to accuracy, um, but in a world where we lack a gold standard really for most of these diagnoses, that seems like a very reasonable approach. And I do want to refer you to a paper, and I apologize, I, I failed to put the citation up here, but there's a very interesting paper published by Chris Ryerson in the Blue Journal this year or last year that proposes an ontology for fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. So not changing the names for these diseases, but providing additional nomenclature regarding the confidence of our diagnosis. Um, a confident diagnosis being one in which we are more than 90% likely they have this disease, meaning it's not anything else. I've excluded all those other things. There's nothing else it could possibly be. It has to be this. That's a confident diagnosis or meets guideline criteria. And then a provisional diagnosis, which is very interesting, is, well, it's not confident, but it's more likely than not. Over 50%, in my mind, my estimation, or our MDD team's estimation, more than 50% likely that this is chronic HP or this is ITF. So then you would, you would then label that person as provisional ITF or provisional chronic HP. So the names of these diseases now get longer. And then, of course, unclassifiable um, is when you have three or more things in your differential and your leading diagnosis is still less than 50% confident. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes that evolves and you can figure it out. Sometimes that requires a biopsy. Um, and actually, that's my last slide. How am I doing on time? I'm a little over, sorry. Okay, um, so that's my last slide. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.